Um, our next speaker will be Elizabeth Melito, and uh, up after her will be Christopher Grant. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Melito, and I'm an attorney with the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Legal Center. I'm going to provide an introduction here, and then I'm going to turn it over to John Rodebaugh, who is representing NFIB in this matter. Um, John will share two key concerns that NFIB has with the board's proposal. NFIB is the nation's leading small business advocacy organization with a national membership of about 350,000 independently owned and operated businesses. While there is no standard definition of small business, the typical NFIB member employs 10 people and reports gross sales of about, about $500,000 a year. NFIB's membership is a reflection of American small business and I am here today on their behalf to share a small business perspective. Currently, small businesses in this country employ just over half of all private sector employees. Small businesses pay 44% of total U.S. private payroll. Small businesses have generated 64% of net new jobs over the past 15 years. In 2008, there were just over 29.5 million businesses in the United States. Businesses with fewer than 500 employees comprised 99.9% of those 29.5 million businesses. Small businesses are America's largest private employer. For this reason, it's critically important that the board understand small firms' unique business structure and the exceptional problems that the board's proposed amendments to NLRB election rules could place on the smallest but arguably most important employers in this country. Despite small businesses' impressive employment statistics, only 12% of small employers have at least one employee dedicated to personnel or human resources matters. And 57% of small business owners had no experience in personnel or human resources before owning their current business. It's no wonder that small businesses struggle to decipher the mysteries of overlapping and sometimes even conflicting federal, state, and local labor and employment laws. In these companies, most employment concerns, including issues related to labor matters, are made by the owners of the business, who upon receipt of an election petition wouldn't have a clue what to do and would not only need to consult with an outside advisor, they would first need to find such an advisor with whom they could consult. I will close by saying that small businesses face unique challenges that make compliance with the NLRA and all employment laws exceedingly difficult for even the most determined business owner. I hope that the board, in considering this proposal, understands and appreciates how detrimental the proposed amendments could be for America's small businesses. Thank you. I'll turn it over to John. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Radabaugh, good morning. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, Chairman Liebman and members Becker, Pearson, Hayes. Thank you for this open meeting. I'm an attorney with the law firm Nixon Peabody. I speak today on behalf of the National Federation of Independent Business. Our nation's labor law was conceived for the purpose of protecting the free flow of commerce by encouraging collective bargaining to avoid disruptions. Under the 76-year-old law, bargaining employees' terms and conditions of employment can only occur between employers and labor organizations chosen by employees to be their representatives. The same law was later amended, one, to allow employees to refrain from third-party representation, recognizing that labor organizations, too, can obstruct commerce and that collective voice may not be desired. Two, to encourage the expression and dissemination of views, argument, and opinion. And three, to direct the board to investigate representation petitions and provide an appropriate hearing upon due notice whenever a question of representation exists. The starting point for representation is employee choice. Choice is the act of selecting freely following consideration of options. Section 8C encourages free debate on issues dividing labor and management. For an employer to engage, it must first become aware. As Canadian experience proves, covert union campaigning results in significantly higher rates of union representation over an open exchange of views by both the union and the employer to inform employees and respond to issues raised. The board's proposed rule would significantly undermine an employer's opportunity to learn of and respond to union organizing by reducing the so-called critical period from petition filing to election from the current median of 38 days to as few as 10 to 21 days. 
To ensure due process and representation case matters, Congress amended Section 9 requiring the Board investigate each petition, provide an appropriate hearing upon due notice, and decide the unit appropriate. The Board's proposed rule would restrict the presentation of evidence, enabling fair deliberation of unit appropriateness issues by creating a 20% voter eligibility unit placement review threshold, imposing a claim it or waive it rule regarding unit scope and related evidentiary issues, and requiring production of detailed employee lists and identifiers. Should the board proceed with its proposed rule, NFIB believes that employee informed choice and due process notice and hearing required by Section 9 may be compromised, particularly for small employers lacking labor relations expertise and in-house legal departments. Respect for the rule of law is critical. When administrations change and case precedent is reversed, when, as in Fiscal year 2009, unions win 74.1% of RC elections for units of 10 or fewer employees and 63.8% overall. When executive branch agencies coordinate actions with independent agencies to assist organized labor. When decades of board and general counsel reports tout successes in meeting time targets, it would be inadvisable for the board to take actions that compromise substantive statutory rights of speech and due process, all viscerally understood by fellow citizens. Finally, the, NLR, the NFIB requests that you consider small businesses' lack of experience, knowledge, and resources to defend their interests regarding labor law, process, and procedures. We respectfully suggest that the board redirect their investigation to identifying the statistically relevant independent variables explaining deviation from the desired median. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adabon, Ms. Toledo. Um, Thank you. Colleagues have questions? I've got a question for both of you, really focused on your expertise uh, in working with small <coughs> businesses. One thing that the proposal attempts to do is both make the process more transparent and provide compliance assistance in the form of a much more detailed description, uh, which will be mandatory for the union to serve with its petition and then somewhat duplicatively for the region to serve as well. Uh, so that the types of businesses you work with will have uh, a blueprint of what to expect if there is a hearing. And then also in the statement of position, uh, a written document such that they will know exactly what they'll be expected to or at least what they'll have the option of taking a position on at the hearing. Um, my question is, is that helpful? Are there other things that we could do in that respect in terms of making the process more transparent and accessible for your clients? I mean, I will I, I certainly commend the board for um, the <coughs> offer to provide additional compliance assistance, and certainly NFIB, that's one thing that we always ask for, um, and it's very helpful for small businesses. Um, that said, um, when it comes to preparing the document, the statement of position, um, and pulling together all the documents that are going to be needed at the hearing, the small business is going to need an outside advisor, um, and that's where they're going to need to look for help. And with all due respect to you know the, the fabulous labor attorneys in this room here, our members don't have folks like that that they can pick up the phone and call. It's going to be you know a process where you know my goodness, what do I do with this? Who do I call? They call the person they identify as their attorney. Their attorney doesn't do labor issues. I haven't a clue. You know, call John Smith down the street. He might be able to help you. So even though it's it's a fabulous that you can spell out more and make it more transparent and provide a blueprint, um, I think they are still going to need outside legal help when it comes to preparing for for peti petition. I, I would second what you just said. I do think that is a good idea. Uh, I think help and uh, bringing someone through the process would, would, would be a step forward. I would just like to go back again to uh, <clears throat> that last comment. Um, it's been decades since I um, finished my <coughs> graduate degree in econometrics, so I don't remember the term, <laughs> but um, when you do the distribution uh, and you get a meeting of 38 days, what I was trying to suggest was if we take whatever that term is for the right side, where it, <laughs> anyway, where it gets strung out, uh, what is it beyond one standard deviation of the desired median? Um, I think that, 
I honestly believe that if if we took say a fiscal year and then mapped out each case that was beyond your median target and then map and map characteristics that we would define as identifying variables of size of employer perhaps uh, uh, even geographic region, uh, if you look at distribution of labor attorneys, um, there aren't a whole lot of them in certain states. But if you, if you could map through that, I, I honestly truly believe it would yield some results. Uh, it would, would help us all decide what it is that causes these longer delays and litigation related issues and then perhaps you could zero in on those and target those types of employers or industries with particularized uh, assistance of the kind you were suggesting. Another question? I, I have a question. Um, uh, is there any kind of standard practice in your, within the members of your federation uh, for what to do when an election petition is filed in terms of uh, Mr. Radabaugh talked in terms of the employer's right to get its views out. Um, is there kind of standard advice that you give or is there a standard practice that your members follow? And, and how long, in your view, does it take for one of these small employers to get its view, to communicate its views with what's going to be a, a pretty small workforce? Um, as I pointed out in my um, remarks, um, in most of the businesses, most NFIB members, 90% of NFIB members employ less than 10, 20 employees. So in those instances, there is not even an employee dedicated to handling human resource matters. So we do not have, our members do not necessarily have somebody on their staff who is a member of, say, sure. Um, so when it comes to labor and employment matters, it oftentimes is the owner of the business or his or her spouse or the bookkeeper who is also you know kind of the administrative person who will open the mail and get the petition so you can you can probably picture how this would go you know they you know opening the mail and you know kind of oh this is a legal document what am I going to do with this so it's going to take some time you know the owner's going to have to look at it. as far as pulling together what's required before the hearing and the position um, I don't believe there is a standard practice I mean it's going to be the you know the owner picking up the phone trying to get help from their attorney who's going to pass them on probably try to find a labor expert who can help them out and figure out what to do. Um, I, but I don't believe that there is a standardized practice just because this is not something that they're confronted with very often. It's, you know, they don't have, they don't have a, you know, standard operating procedure because this is not something that comes up in their business. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you for your comments today and for being with us.